So let me first start off by uh, prefacing again, if you are watching online, uh, if you're joining us um, electronically, I guess you could say to a certain extent, this is the first Sunday of the month, and here at West Houston, this will be a uh, Sunday where we take uh, and observe communion. So if you want to grab those or get those ready here in just a second, um, you're just kind of your um, 20, 30 minute warning, give or take. So with that, let me go ahead and ask, um, has there ever been a time or uh, an opportunity you've had where you're just like, I need to convince somebody of this situation? Like, I don't know if there's something where you're in a position and, and you're saying, this is, this is the way that I view things and I'm trying to convince you to my point of view. Or perhaps there's um, a situation where you know this is the right way to go and you're trying to say like, hey, this, this is the right path and this is why you should follow it kind of a thing. This actually happened back in 1774. We had somebody by the name of Frederick II of Prussia, otherwise known as Frederick the Great. If you're into history, uh, that might ring a little bit more of a bell. And he was trying to find a way to feed his people. Again, if you're not too familiar, the moniker great, whenever it comes after name, it always means for somebody who's uh, expanded the kingdom, right? So in, I forget which history, but Alexander the Great, again, he conquered lots of territories, expanded the kingdom, and continued to, to grow the territories. And so Frederick the Great in uh, essentially what's now known as Germany, he, he expanded the kingdom that he was under. And with that expansion of the kingdom comes many more mouths to feed. Right? When you have more territories, you have more people. When you have more people, you need a bigger army. When you have more people and a bigger army, you need lots of food. Right? And so essentially, during that time, the most common way to feed people was bread. But also during this time, they were also in the Seven Years' War. I think it was Germany fighting with France and somebody else. I can't remember the other country off the top of my head. But they're in the Seven Years' War, and in this situation, flour being imported into Germany was basically now being blockaded, because they were like, we're fighting with you, why would we supply you with things to help your people? So they started cutting off flour and, and eliminating ways that they could feed their people. And so uh, Frederick the Great came up with this idea. He was like, well, instead of relying on flour, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell my people, plant potatoes. We're going to plant potatoes, and that's what's going to feed the people, and we'll save the bread for the army. Because, again, it's easier to package flour into a little bag versus a giant sack of potatoes, right? So it's easier that way. So he's like, okay, people are going to eat potatoes. But the people did not like that decision. They were like, this is gross. Like, have you looked at a potato? It's dirty. It is not clean. They actually have it from one of the quotes uh, that I can get from one of the people. They said, the things have neither smell nor taste not even the dogs will eat them, so what use are they to us? That's how they felt about potatoes. But nonetheless, Frederick the Great was like, well, this is the solution I'm going to pitch. And so what he did was he told his guards, he told his people, hey, in my royal garden, we're going to plant potatoes. And I want you to guard them ferociously. And I'll tell you why I air quote that here in a second. So he planted these potatoes, and he called them part of his royal garden. And of course, since the king eats well, everybody was like, we need to steal from the king to feed the poor. So they started running into the garden and stealing the potatoes. And this is part all of his plan because he told his guards that as you're guarding the potatoes, like if somebody comes up and like, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks or whatever the equivalent of their German currency at that time. It's like, hey, I'll give you $20 if you just let me run into the field and steal potatoes. And Frederick was like, take that money. Right? Take that money, let them steal the potatoes. In fact, if they don't and they get caught, take a bribe and let them go free. Like, let them take the potatoes and run away with them. So he convinced the people that this royal potato, essentially, was something to be revered, something to be sought after. And eventually they realized, hey, instead of like, quote unquote, risking our lives to go get these potatoes, we could plant them and grow them ourselves. And of course, that's what they did. So no longer were the royal potatoes strictly reserved for royalty, it became a common food amongst all the people. And now that's why, in a lot of German food, you have uh, heavy potato dishes because of the influence of Frederick the Great. How much of that story is completely true versus just fabrications of history and people telling it? I'm not quite sure. I mean, he did make a decree, so he could have just made it rule, and that's maybe how he cleaned up the history a little bit. But nonetheless, this idea of, hey, in order for us to survive, in order for our country to thrive, in order for you not to die because you're starving, there's famine going on, there's uh, droughts going on, there's, there's people taking away our flour. In order for you to have food to eat, I'm going to say we eat these potatoes. This is the way that we're going to live, the way that we're going to survive and to thrive. And in the same idea of trying to convince people of something that would ultimately save them, 
We're diving into this new series in the Gospel of John, this series that I am calling uh, So That You Would Believe. Right here in the Gospel of John, it is perhaps one of my favorite books, and if you've heard me say that about other books, that's equally true of other books. There are a lot of favorite books in the Bible that I favorite, Uh, but this one in particular kind of has a, a special place in my heart, and I know for a lot of Christians in general, the Gospel of John also holds one in theirs, because For a lot of people, when they first came into faith, when they first decided to put their trust in Jesus, or even as people were saying like, hey, this is somebody you should look into, I challenge you, just read through the Gospel of John. Alright, so a lot of people's first experience, first exposure to Christianity was in the Gospel of John. And what I want to do today is kind of give you an overview of the Gospel of John so that you can understand and see just how impactful and why it has been so impactful and where we're going to be ultimately for the next couple months, several months even at that. So um, again, I'm not going to really go into a whole lot of Bible, but if you want to just have John, you can kind of scroll through and kind of see some of these things. Uh, But there's not going to be as much passage to go through today. As again, I just kind of want to uh, paint a picture for us of just what John is um, and and where it kind of lands inside of the, the books themselves. So first thing to start off with is who wrote John? Now, it may seem obvious because the title is the Gospel of John, and if you guess John, you would be correct. It is John. But there's a little bit more nuance that I kind of want to dive into as to who, uh, not necessarily who is John, but, but how we came to know that John wrote the Gospel of John. Because if you read through the Gospel of John from the first chapter to the very 21st chapter, it never technically says, I, John, wrote this Gospel to you. Right? We never have an official declaration that John wrote this book. What we do have is somebody who titles themselves the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, reading through the commentaries and, and the authorships of this book, probably my favorite comments of this was that somebody was like, maybe John didn't write his name because he was just a really humble guy. Right? He's just, just like, look at this apostle. He's so humble, he doesn't even name himself in his gospel. But I kind of find that funny when he's like, I'm not going to name myself, but look at the gospel, of, look at the apostle of John. Jesus loved me most, right? It's, it's kind of this funny dichotomy that I just found amusing of just humble John, who Jesus happens to love the most, that I'm going to say every time, instead of saying John, I'm going to say, Jesus loved me most, right? It's just, I don't know, I just thought it was an amusing commentary of just like, how can you argue that when he makes this? It just seemed kind of amusing to me. But nonetheless, that's the, the name that he has in place. Whenever you see Jesus, or whenever you see in the Gospel of John, when it says the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's referring to himself. He's referring to John. But one of the main reasons why we attribute the Gospel of John to the authorship of John is because Polycarp, one of the early church fathers, basically one of the people right after the apostles died, Polycarp, who was actually a disciple of John, said that John told me he wrote this. Right? So if one of the early church fathers said, this is the person who wrote it, and that's basically the closest connection we have to the person themselves, and we have no other historical facts, documents, or anything that state otherwise, we're going to go with that. But on top of that, with other books that we know are attributed to John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, as well as Revelations, all of these fit within the same kind of writing style and the way that John would have written. Right? So again, all of us have our own types of personalities. When you text, when you write, when you speak, we all kind of sound a certain particular way. Right? So when you compare those things, you can, you've, you've had those times where you're like, that, that sounds like that person, right? That's, that's kind of what we're looking at. When we look at the Gospel of John and we compare that to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelation, you see kind of a similar writing style that erupts between all of these things. And 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as Revelation, are all titled to John. So it makes sense that he also wrote the Gospel of John because his writing style fits. Polycarp said that John wrote it. All of this kind of fits together. So we attribute the Gospel of John to John himself. Now perhaps more important than who wrote it is why he wrote it. See, John's Gospel is a little different when it compares to the other three. In fact, the other three are so similar between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're so similar that we call them the synoptic gospels. Now, synoptic comes from a Greek word called synophis, which kind of means seeing all together. Right? So if you were to look at this group and I looked at everybody, I could say I'm synopsising you because I'm looking at all of you all together. 
So when you look at the first three books, it kind of sees one big picture. And you can actually find different charts that show uh, the intersections of, well, this part covers Mark, this one is in Matthew, and this one is Luke. This is where they cross-apply here. This is where these two cross-apply. This is where all three sync up all together. You see a lot of commonality between those three Gospels. But then when you come to the Gospel of John, 95% of the Gospel of John is unique to John. This also helps because it was written significantly later. And let me get into that here right now, actually. With the Gospel of Matthew, it was written towards Jewish believers. That's why Matthew, when you look at Matthew 1.1, it starts with, this is the genealogy of Jesus. And he starts with Abraham. Right? It would have been very important for Jewish people to see that this links back to the covenant father, back to Father Abraham, whom all the 12 tribes from all of us have descended upon. It is important that we see that Jesus came from Abraham. And so Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, showed all the way through, from Jesus all the way to Abraham, that genealogy. And you can trace that through, and you can see all the links between that chain. Now Mark, he writes his gospel mainly to Rome, right? To the Roman citizens, to the Gentiles, even to a certain extent. And he doesn't include a genealogy because the Roman citizens are like, we don't know any of these people. Like, you could give us all these names, but like, that means nothing to us. And so he just kicks off his book and he kind of speeds through the ministry of Jesus. Not in like a, I'm trying to just run a rush through it, but, but you always hear this kind of like, and then, and then next, and immediately following, you hear this like movement within Mark because he's talking to an audience that doesn't know the background and the culture that the Jewish audience would have needed to understand to justify that. He's talking to people who, who are interested in the story of what Jesus did, who Jesus was. And from there, we look at Luke, who was uh, writing his as more of a historical document. And so he goes back to the birth of John the Baptist. Right? If I'm going to talk about Jesus, I need to include everything about Jesus, including this guy, John the Baptist, who was the hairbringer of Jesus. I need to talk about the guy who said, this guy is coming, whose, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to tie. And so Luke starts off and he brings us all the way back to the beginning of John the Baptist. And so John and his gospel, it's often thought that he wrote this as a response. That there was many people fighting about who Jesus was. Was Jesus really God? These gospels tell of this person, but does he really defend himself as God? And so John writes his gospel kind of as a response as the first three were all written much earlier. Anywhere from 60 to 70 AD, the first three gospels were written. John's gospel is estimated anywhere as early as like 85 to some will even date it really late to like 120. So John's gospel is written significantly later. So he's had time to kind of see how people are responding to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John writes his gospel in response to how the people are responding to the gospel. This is why, again, John's gospel is so different. He doesn't need to include the things that have already been discussed. He's writing in response to the critiques, to the, the questions, to the heresies that are starting to arise. Some of the unique parts about John is that you won't find a single parable in John. Not one parable is told. Not even one mention of a single demon or spirit that Jesus cast out. In fact, John's gospel doesn't even use the word repent. Not one time does John mention repenting. Instead, we see this word believe. That again, you would believe that Jesus is God. He uses that word 98 times throughout this entire gospel. John wanted us to see that Jesus is God. And he connected those so much that that's how he started his book. All right, in John 1, 1, you read, in the beginning. And that sounds familiar because in Genesis 1.1 it says, in the beginning. Right? John doesn't even go back to John the Baptist. He goes back to the beginning of time to show that when God was there, Jesus was there. That Jesus and God have been there from the very beginning of time. That Jesus is God, has always been God, will always be God, and you cannot question that. And you must believe that. And that is why he is writing this gospel. So that you would see Jesus as the Son of God, that you would believe in him, that you would be saved by him, and that you would have eternal life through him. That is John's purpose here in his gospel. And so the last thing that I'll do before I kind of make a formal conclusion at least, is kind of give just a very high-level overview of the entire book. You could call this kind of like the, the cliff notes or spark notes or... 
I don't know if any of that stuff even exists anymore. I haven't used one of those in a while. So if you do know that you, they are, then you know what this is. If you don't, then I don't know, whatever YouTube internet synopsis you can find. Basically, that's kind of what I want to do. Just in a few minutes here, this is the entire Gospel of John. So the Gospel of John can be divided up into four major sections. The first and the last, much, much shorter. The middle two, significantly longer. Right, so it starts off with the prologue. Chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 19. You kind of have this uh, announcement of, again, who Jesus is, how he's connected to God, and kind of establishing John the Baptist and all these things as well. And then from there, it kicks off from the rest of chapter 1 all the way through 12. It connects and, and it calls it uh, the book of signs, and it's the, the more public ministry of Jesus. And then from there, in chapters 13 through 20, you have the more private ministry of Jesus, often sometimes called the, the book of glory, because it hits all the high points of, of Jesus coming to the culmination of being crucified of seeing his life, of seeing all the prophecies, of seeing all the things that he has foretold come to this conclusion, come to this peak here at his crucifixion. And then finally, in the last chapter, chapter 21, you see this epilogue. It covers a couple stories, it covers a couple things that Jesus says after his resurrection. Now, another thing to note as a, a topic that comes over as the entire part of John is you see this repetitiveness of seven. Mainly in two parts, and ultimately in John's writing, you see seven pop up a lot. In the number of signs Jesus performed in this gospel, there are seven signs that he makes. Throughout the entire gospel, seven times Jesus says, I am. In the book of Revelations, as he continues, John talks about the seven seals that are broken. He talks about the seven trumpets that are blown. He talks about the seven bowls that are pulled out. I don't know if he directly made this, but again, he talks about the seven letters that were written to the churches. If you study numerology within the Bible, they say that seven often stands for completion, right? That when you have seven, it means that everything is done, all right? This goes back all the way again to Genesis, when God created the earth in six days, but he took the seventh to rest, that it took seven days to create the entire world. And so at the seventh day, when God said, it is finished, it was complete. And so from then, this pattern of seven continues all throughout the Bible. And so from there, John is very much pointing towards us to the completion of Jesus' divinity. All right, when we look at the seven signs, he talks about one, Jesus turning the water into wine. It reveals Jesus as ultimately as the, the source of life. That Jesus heals the nobleman. This talks about how he has dominion over distance. That there's no distance that he cannot heal from. That his sovereignty goes everywhere. His third miracle, when he heals the man at the pool, demonstrates his power over time. That it doesn't matter when the pool bubbles up. That Jesus heals regardless of those things. That Jesus feeding the 5,000 demonstrates that Jesus sustains us. That he has the capability, the ability the opportunity to give us what we need whenever we need it. When Jesus walks on water, it tells us how Jesus rules over nature. In the sixth miracle, when Jesus heals the man born blind, he portrays Jesus as, as revealing light to the world. And then the seventh uh, sign miracle that we look at was when he resurrected Lazarus from the dead, and it shows his absolute rule over death. And some talk about an a eighth sign, so to say, a miracle of the resurrection itself. Most people can just categorize that into the book of glory. But some argue that was a public sign as well. But, uh, here there. Um, but again, you see these seven signs that Jesus performs to show his divinity over everything here on earth. His rule over earth sprinkled all throughout his book. And including with that, we also have these seven I am statements that he makes. These are significant because to say I am, again, is to say that you are God. That when we read I am, whenever Jesus said it that way, I am this, as we'll cover in a second, he is saying in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, Yahweh. Again, Yahweh was the, the nomiker for, for God, right? It was the way that you wrote God's name. And uh, it was always spelled Y-H-W-H, if I'm not mistaken. Because again, in, in Hebrew, there are no vowels. So it's just consonants. And so Yahweh is, again, just the best that we can pronounce it. And so when God said, I am, when he talked to Moses on the mountain, he said, who sent you? He said, say, I am sent you. Yahweh sent you. 
that even in the Jewish books, when you see them write God, they don't feel privileged enough that they'll write G slash D. That's how revered they hold this name, that they will not actually write God because they are not worthy to write God. And Jesus comes and says, I am Yahweh. I am God. And he makes seven statements in this same idea. First one, he says, I am the bread of life. That again, he says that Jesus is the bread that provides life. That I'm not just the one that sustains you physically, but I am the one who provides for you spiritually. That he says, I am the light of the world. That in this world filled with darkness, Jesus is the one who shines through all of it. That when Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep, he says that there is only one way to God, and that is through me. Then when he says, I am the good shepherd, Jesus foreshadows his own sacrifice, that a shepherd would sacrifice his life for his sheep. Jesus says, I am that shepherd that I sacrifice myself for you. That when he says, I am the resurrection and life, he talks again of having authority over life and over death. That not only will he overcome death, but he provides life. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus shows that there are many beliefs, but again, there is still only one way to God, that it is through him. And then finally, when he says, I am the true vine, he says, staying connected to Christ is the only way to accomplish God's will, that you can only do things to bring God glory through him. These are all the statements that boldly told anybody listening that Jesus is saying, I am truly God. That God has come down from heaven onto earth that became flesh. That the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is John's gospel to us. To illustrate again to us that Jesus was God. That God was here with us, dwelt among us, suffered with us, remained sinless, died for us. And through our belief and our faith in him and his conquering of the cross that we would have eternal life. Now, if you felt like I went through those seven signs and those seven I am statements a little too fast, again, no worries. We're going to spend almost a sermon on each of those things here later on. So again, just bear with it. We'll give it some time. But to come to a close here this morning, I'm going to look at two different responses that we can have to the Gospel of John. At the very end, we see two different stories come about. I think we can respond one like Thomas. When Thomas heard from all the other disciples, they came and they told him, Jesus is alive. Jesus is resurrected. He has conquered the grave. Thomas was like, I don't believe it. I need to see it myself. I won't believe that he has risen from the grave unless I can put my hand through his. Unless I can feel his hands, I won't believe it. And when Jesus comes, he doesn't shun Thomas. He doesn't say, how terrible of you. He says, come and see. Come and test me. Come and experience the grace that I have. I think that's something that we can experience as well. That we can see that Christ is faithful. That we can come and see how time and time and time again, Jesus is true to the seven signs that he has committed to. To the seven I am statements that he has made. That Jesus is God. And that it is our faith in him, and again, his work on the cross alone, that saves us. So I think, again, we can respond with doubt, and we can see how Jesus hears that doubt, and just continues to respond in faith. I think the second way that we can potentially respond to this is the way of Peter. That before his sacrifice, before he was uh, sacrificed on the cross... Jesus challenged Peter and he said, will you, who will stand by me? And Peter said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And Jesus told him, before the night ends, you will forsake me three times. And after Peter does that, on the third time, he locks eyes with Jesus. And he realizes the very words that Jesus told him. That he foretold of this forsaking. And he runs away in shame. And after Jesus is resurrected, he comes to Peter and he restores him. Not once, not twice, but three times. Each time that Peter forsook 
Jesus. Jesus restores Peter. And I think that's how we can sometimes respond when we look at this as well. That there are times where we may be doing something we may not be supposed to be. That maybe we're engaging in a behavior we shouldn't be. That maybe we're looking at something we shouldn't be. That maybe we're doing something we know we shouldn't be doing. Whatever it may be. That when we look at upon the cross, when we come to Jesus and we recognize his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus doesn't push us away. He doesn't say that that's too great of a sin. He doesn't say that you don't know me anymore. He continues to seek restoration with us. He continues to bestow grace upon us. That when we seek repentance, he offers grace. And ultimately, he challenges Peter every single time when he restores him. He says, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. I think that's, again, how we respond here in faith. That when we repent from our sins, when we see how we've wronged Christ, when we see how we've gone against God, when we repent of those things, we are challenged, again, to love the people here in this community. The people here in this room the people that we continue to live life alongside of, the people that we continue to encourage, that we are the sheep and we encourage one another. That we're called to, again, to take care of his lambs, to continue to go forth and find those who have been lost, to engage with this community, to engage with this neighborhood, to engage with this world and continue to share the gospel that anyone who would hear it and respond would come to salvation, would come to know Christ and make him their savior with no salvation. That we've been challenged again to, to prove our doubt wrong and to see our faith in action. I think those are the two big ways that we can see response here in the Gospel of John. That we have to love on the people in this world to continue to know him and to make him known. So again, I hope you guys are as excited for John as I am. Again, it is still and will always be one of my favorite books. It still has one of the key verses that whether anybody is Christian or not, they still know John 3.16. They know parts of it. They know bits and pieces. They know that for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that anyone who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And so I hope as we dive into this and see that explored, to see that God came down as man, dwelt among us, suffered alongside us, sacrificed himself on the cross, defeated the grave, and our faith in him in that work again leads to salvation. That we take that message, bring it to the world, and continue to see, just again, next steps taken for each of us, next steps taken again in this community and in this world, and continue to see the gospel grow, the kingdom built, And again, just the work of Christ within each and every one of us. So with that, let me pray for us and we'll respond in song here this morning. Father, again, we thank you and we just come before you again, just excited to see just what you will reveal to us here in the Gospel of John. And again, God, in whatever way that we respond, whether we doubt, whether we respond with repentance, whether there's something else that you just put upon our hearts, Thank you, God, we know that you are good, that you are sovereign, that you have a plan for your glory, and that your grace never ends. Time and time and time again, again, we can test and know that you are good. And so, God, would you continue to be with us as we dive into the series, as we dive into the Gospel of John, and continue to see Christ, continue to see love, continue to see the sacrifice, continue to grow in who it is that you are, who you've transformed us to be, and to take that to the world. So God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this. I just continue to praise you with everything we do. We do these things and pray these things all in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.